Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Matthew S. Holland, president of Utah Valley University, and it is my privilege to welcome you to the Reed and Christine Halliday Executive Lecture Series. Today we have an extra special guest, Mr. Hal Wing. Uh, Harold R. Wing is the founder and chairman of the board of Wing Enterprises, makers of the Little Giant Ladder Systems. Hal, as he prefers to be called, has led a life dedicated to hard work and service to his family, business, nation, community, and church. Hal and his wife, Brigitte Mayer Wing, raised seven children. Earlier in his life, Hal served in the United States Army, stationed in Germany from 1958 to 1961. Hal began his career as a young father of seven children working day shifts at Albertson's Markets and nights at the Salt Lake City Stockyards loading hogs, in addition to weekend part-time jobs. His commitment to hard work and his family have taken him from those humble beginnings to where he stands today, founder and chairman of a successful global corporation. Hal has also served in both Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush's administrations as a representative at several national conferences on small business. He was elected mayor of Springville, City, Utah, and served on the panel of the Mountainland Association of Government Regional Review Committee. Hal was named the National Republican Party Committee's Businessman of the Year in 2003 and again in 2006. He received the 2006 National Entrepreneur of the Year Award from Ernest & Young and recently received the Business of the Year Award from the Utah County Commission for his, con for his company's contributions to the Utah economy. In October 2010, he became only the fourth person inducted into the Utah Entrepreneurial Forum Hall of Fame. He serves on the local Wells Fargo Board of Directors and is a regular speaker at universities and educational institutions. He and his wife are also the founders of the philanthropic organization, the Wing Benevolent Fund, and have served together three German-speaking missions for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, we also have his name on our new track that sits on the west side of campus, right there on I-15. Uh, Hal has been a longtime benefactor and friend of Utah Valley University, and he's become a friend of Matt Holland. It's a delight to work with this man and learn from him, as I'm sure you all will today as we hear from him. With that, Mr. Wing, we invite you forward. Wow. Um, wow. I, I look out at, at uh, you wonderful young people, and uh, the first impression I have is one of envy. And I mean that sincerely. I am truly envious of the situation you have. You are at a point in life when you have your entire professional careers ahead of you, and you are learning in one of the top-notch institutions in the country, much less the state, that's growing rapidly. And, and, and as President Holland was uh, giving me accolades that make me kind of uncomfortable, I, I had the feeling of the, like the gentleman that was at a funeral, and partway through the, the, the funeral talks, he got up and walked over and looked inside the casket and came back, sat next to his wife, and she looked at him and said, what in the world was that all about? He said, I just wanted to see if they're talking about the same guy I knew. <laughs> because it doesn't sound like him. That doesn't sound like me. I, I've been blessed to have a, a lot of wonderful people help me along the way. Now, I understand, I may have understood it, uh, wrongly, but I understand that a lot of you people are looking forward to a career of going into business and, and doing your own thing. And for that, oh, I applaud you. I would rather work 22 hours a day for myself than six hours a day for someone else. And now it's, it's not going to be an easy journey, but trust me, it's going to be a wonderful journey. Um, I was just sharing with Brad Mertz before the meeting started. I was in this since about three years, I had seven small children, and uh, I was sleeping in my car about 310, 320 days a year on the road because I really couldn't afford to go to a motel, and I was calling home once a month, and it was really tough. And one evening, my bishop came to see me, brought his two counselors with him, and said, Brother Wing, we need to talk. 
I said, fine. And they sat down on my sofa and looking as somber, somber as they could, looked at me and said, Brother Wing, we're here to ask you to give up this crazy dream of yours and get a real job. And you know, that was tough. That was really, really tough to take that. And as they left, I prayerfully considered it and thought, no, they don't see the dream that I see. They do not see the pieces that can fall into place. They don't, they don't have the vision I have. What's interesting about this whole story is that uh, the bishop ended up working for me. So <laughs> <laughs> it, it, was, it had a happy ending all the way around. You know, I, I was making about what you'd call around a quarter of a million dollars a year at the time that I ran across the gentleman in Germany that had the original idea for the ladder. Since then, we have 26 additional patents, and uh, it was an interesting relationship. His, his ability to create an idea was fantastic, and my ability to take that idea and make it better and market it turned out to be a, a, a perfect marriage. It worked out very, very well. And so when I met this gentleman, uh, I went to my first trade show. And while I'm there, two brothers came up to see me. And their, their names, Don, the, the main brother's name was Don Werner. And you all have heard of Werner Ladder Company. And the first thing they said to me was, you know, my brother and I are over here laughing at you. We can't believe how stupid you are. And I had, had my attention right away. I said, what, what do you mean, stupid? And he said, <laughs> Well, we had an opportunity to take that ladder, and as have 13 other companies and 14 people give that ladder a crack, and nobody's been able to make it work, and you're not going to be able to make it work either. So, you know, it, it, when you have a bunch of naysayers, you need to dig deep, and you need to look at yourself, and you decide whether or not you can make that work. But one of the things that I learned, I, I, I don't know if you've ever considered what's going to be your most important asset as you start off on this journey of yours to, to build something wonderful. And remember, please remember this, that it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. It's never going to be a sprint for most people. Every once in a while you'll have somebody that, that hit an idea that's so novel and so new and so great that it has instantaneous success. But mostly it's, it's, a, it's a marathon. But remember that your most important asset is not the patents, not the product, it's not the bricks and mortar, it's not the machinery. The most important asset you will ever have will be your employees. They will make or break you. And you, you need to get where you treat them like they should be treated. I've seen so many people that like to take employees and burn them out and cast them aside and, and grab the next group. You can do that, but it's, it will never end up in the kind of success I think that you're that you're desiring to get. And you need to have respect for people. Now, my father, I grew up on a farm, and my dad was a third grade educated farmer. How many of you know what an irrigation ditch is? It's wonderful. So you also know what a head gate is, right? I learned from my father, who never, ever lost his temper. Never, never saw him lose his temper. But he was the wisest man that I have ever known as far as wisdom, teaching you things by example. Anyway, one night, we were done with, the, with the, the corn. We'd been hoeing corn all day long. I was tired. I was dusty. I was 17. And I had never, ever talked back to my dad. But you know, at 17, I thought I knew a lot. In fact, I thought I knew more than anybody else in some ways. And as we walked down out of the fields, and we'd had about a half a mile to go to the house, we were walking by the hog pens, and, and dad stopped and turned and looked at me and said, son, the Blanchards are irrigating tonight, and I forgot to pull the head gate, which means the wastewater from Blanchards who are upstream from us would get around the ga the, their head gate, get blocked up by ours, and flood a field that we were going to be working in the next day. He said, would you please walk up and pull that head gate so that we don't end up with wastewater? And I don't know what hit me, but I looked at my dad and I said, what did you say, Dad? He said, just go up and pull the head gate, would you? And I looked at him, and I said, Dad, I can see your lips moving, but I can't hear words you're saying. And whoa, well, I thought, this is where the rockets go off, and this is where he loses his temper. But he didn't. This man had the wisdom to not do that. He just kind of ducked his head, walked up the dusty trail, 
pulled the head. It was like a mile up, up and back, and he pulled the head gate. And as I walked down toward the house, I thought, well, two things. One, I've hurt someone I love very dearly, but I've shown him I'm my own man. I've, I've kind of mapped out my territory here. And then the third thought hit me. After supper, you're going to get it. And, and then uh, after supper, I didn't get it. And I thought, okay, he's going to prolong this. Sometime tomorrow, I'm going to get it. Didn't happen tomorrow. Didn't happen next week. It didn't happen next month. I'm 17. The chores are done. Three months later, I walk in. Dad's reading the newspaper and in what we call his big easy chair. And I said, Dad. And he drops his paper down. I said, yeah. I said, the junior prom's coming up, Dad. I'd like to get dibs on the cars before anybody else asks for it. It's funny, son. I can see your lips moving, but I can't hear a word you're saying. <laughs> so I walked to the, I walked to the uh, prom. But it taught me something. It taught me that you show respect to people, that the way you yell into the forest is the way that it eventually echoes back. Now, my wife got mad at me uh, this last month, as a matter of fact. I was talking to someone who wants to write a book on my life, and, and I, don't, I don't think it's worthy of, of writing or, or worthy of reading. And as I turned them down, I said, you know, you, you think it's about me, but it's not. It's about the wonderful people who put me on their back and carry me up the mountain every day. Without them, I would be flipping burgers at McDonald's. And as I laid the phone down and came out of my, my den at, at home, my wife met me at the door, and she, she's a, a little five-foot German gal that can get pretty direct. And she says, I never want to hear you say that again. You're always telling people what a great employee uh, force you have, what a great work, workforce, and how they brought you along the way. Now, I want to ask you a few simple questions, OK? Who was here when you were putting ladders together on our kitchen table because we didn't have a garage? Who was here with you when you were sleeping in your car almost four years, 300 plus days a year? Who was here with you when you were working 30 hours without sleep and getting a couple hours sleep and, and then going back after it? Who was there with you when you couldn't sell ladders at the first trade show, and so you went home and put on your lederhosen, your German lederhosen, and your little Tyrolean hat and your suspenders and your knee socks, and you climbed up on a ladder and went, so that people would stop and look at it. Where, where were these people? And so, you know, I, I started to think right then and there, hello, maybe she does have a point. Okay, they weren't there at the very beginning. But to become anything more than a one-man band, you have, you have to have people, good people. And let me tell you what you look for in people. I wish I had my college degree. I, I wish I had it in the worst of ways, and I don't have it. And it's one of those things that my life is a big blank spot, okay? But I was going to school to become an engineer, and then my brother passed away and left three children orphaned. And my wife and I, within a short period of time after that, we had three already, we had two more. So we had eight children, the oldest was not quite six. They were all the same age. I'm not quite 24 years of age, and I've got 10 mouths to take care of. I tried, I really tried working all night long and going to school during the day, and I just couldn't make it. I, I tried for six months, I wasn't man enough to pull it off. So I quit. The reason I quit, as I came home one night, having cleaned a bunch of offices and a dairy, and, and my wife had gone with me. She would empty the waste baskets while I did the heavy work. And there was my little four-year-old daughter, 3 o'clock in the morning, running up and down the street, tears running down her cheeks, looking for her mommy and daddy. And it broke my heart. I uh, took her in the house and settled her down and put her to bed. One had a word of prayer, prayer with my wife, and then I... I thought, you know what? Somebody could have snatched her, and I'd never see her again. But she could have gotten over by a car. Or the house could have caught on fire, and I'd not see any of them again. What is a college education worth? It's worth a lot. It's not quite worth that much. So we made the decision then and there that I would, I would quit, and I would do something else with my life until later. And I never got around to later. My plea to you today is don't quit. 
whatever the, however difficult it may seem, however discouraged you may be, whatever the economy starts to look like, whatever personal responsibilities come your way, unless it's eight kids under the age of five, don't quit. It is worth the journey. Stay in there, hang on. You know, I, I was in California once, and I had a, a van full of ladders, and I was looking for a place that I was going to be meeting the next morning and try to sell them some ladders. And we'd lost a license plate off the van. I had a, excuse me, I had a partner at that time. And uh, here we are at like 1 o'clock in the morning looking for this address so we wouldn't be late the next morning. And the police pulled me over. Now, you've got to understand, I've had a lot of talks with police officers because they don't like it when you're sleeping in the back of your car in a, in a mall or in a, in a Safeway or an Albertsons or a, something like that. They always wake you up and say, what are you doing, and move along. Well, they stopped me this night, and uh, they said, what's in, the, what's in the van? I said, ladders. We had them boxed up. Where'd you get them? <laughs> They're mine. Yeah, well, uh, you have some proof. I said, what do you mean do I have proof? And he said, well, bill of sale. I said, excuse me, it's my inventory. They're mine. And he kept pushing, and they wanted to take me down, and they wanted to do some, and book me, as a matter of fact, on suspicion of, of burglary. And my partner says to me, how? How? Show him. He says, excuse me? He said, show him the ladder. And so <laughs> I pulled the ladder out. How many of you have seen the infomercial? It's crazy, isn't it? Anyway, I, I pulled the ladder out, and I went zip, 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 zip. You know, you've got four different A-frames. You've got the staircase ladder. You've got an extension ladder. You can make a scaffolding out of it. You can do all these wonderful 24 different things. And I got through, put the ladder back down, and standing at four foot seven in storage position. And the younger officer looked at the older officer and said, they got to be his. <laughs> they got to be his. What was really fun was the younger guy was working the second job as a painter and bought a ladder. So it was a good, thought, a good stop for me. It, it worked out really well. But I found that when people come to me and look, look for a job for me, with me, there are certain things that I cannot teach them. If they don't have good moral values, okay, if they're not honest, with me, even with themselves, if they don't have work ethic, if they don't have a sense of loyalty to you or to whomever it is that they're working for, these are not things that I can instill in someone. I cannot instill in you at this point in time in your life. That's something only you can do. And generally, if they haven't learned it by the time they're 18, 19, 20 years old or older, they're not going to make it. Elder Sutherland one day said, you know, people change, but not much, not much. And it takes an awful lot for someone to change. Now, if you, if having said what I said about college degrees, if you look in my organization, I have less than six people that have a, a college degree. And it's not by, it's not by uh, choice that way. But I needed an engineer, of course, and I needed a chief financial officer. And, and those type of people I had to have that had earned their way in life. I love to bring people that have a degree in. But a lot of these people come to me, and they say, Brother Wing, I'm LDS, and I don't care what faith they are. Okay, I don't care what faith they are. If they bring certain, if it's not clean, you know, don't think if it's not true, don't say it. If it's not good, don't do it. Get by those three things with me, you're okay. But they come to me and they say, "Are you hiring?" And in the beginning, I couldn't say no to anybody. I don't know what it was, but I just couldn't say no to anybody. So here I was making the equivalent of a quarter of a million dollars a day, working uh, as a salesperson. And I went home one day and said to my wife, I want to quit. I want the opportunity to work up and down one row as I did with my dad. I learned so much shoulder to shoulder with him with a hole in my hand. I'm not able to pass that on to my children. I want to work with my kids. She said, how much money are we going to have to live on? I said, it'll be around 8,500. And <laughs> she said, honey, there are 10 of us, OK? I mean, it's me and you and the kids. I said, I understand that, honey, but this is something I really want to do. But anyway, people would come up to me, and I was paying people five and six times what I was paying myself because I knew I needed to have these people to hang on. But let me give you a little word of advice of working with your people, as you will be working with people. Don't, don't judge people at the finish line. 
please do not judge people at the finish line. We tend to do that as human beings. You may find that the person that can walk one lap around this new track you have out here has made greater progress and is a greater athlete than someone who can run a four minute mile. Why? Because they may have been born with spinal meningitis, they may have had a horrible accident in their life, there may be some handicap that they're overcoming. So we need to look at where people start from. I'll give you an example. I had a, a man, well, we were, we were looking for one individual to come to work for us. And uh, they brought in maybe about two and a half to three inches worth of applications for one job. I put them on my desk. And as the production manager went to leave, he said, oh, by the way, you can take that top, uh, that top resume and, and throw it away. I said, why? He said, the guy's a loser. <laughs> I said, did he put loser down on his resume? <laughs> he said, no. And I said, well, how do you know he's a loser? He said, well, the guy from Humphreys Welding Supply was just leaving uh, when this guy came in. And, I mean, it was huge. It was coming in and this guy was leaving. And he said, what's that guy doing here? He said, well, I think he's applying for a job. And he said, you don't want him, he's a loser. And I said, okay, reason. He said he was a police officer and got caught taking things out of people's car at night and spent five years at the point of the mountain. Now, my interest was on a very high alert level right then and there. Not because I was worried, but because I was curious. So I took that resume, pushed all the others to the side, and guess what I saw? good education, had served a two-year LDS mission, was an Eagle Scout, had four children and a wife. I put everything else aside, called this man, asked him to come in for an interview, and I couldn't believe what I saw. He was huge, big, big hulking guy. I mean, he just filled the doorway, but it was all muscle. And, but there was a humility in his eyes and a desire to work that I had rarely seen before. And so I hired him, and I hired him at minimum wage, which I've never done before or since. If you hire somebody at minimum wage, where do they think they're worth? Minimum. But when this guy came to work, I knew where he was at all times because he had a big key ring on his, on his side, and you could always hear that jingling. He was always moving fast, going where he was going and working hard. He did not need supervision. So he got raised after raise after raise, and here's the point I want to make. One day I went back in the back, and he was working as usual. And I walked up to him and I had a key in my hand. I said, you're gonna need this key. He said, what does it do? <laughs> I said, well, it's a master key and it opens every door in this place, including my office. I, he just looked at me and then he looked and he said, I, we need to talk, we need to talk. I said, okay, he pulled me over behind a stack of ladders and he's looking down at his feet and he's shuffling around. And I said, just a minute. Are you trying to tell me that you were once a police officer and you got caught with your fingers in the till and you spent five years at the point of the mountain? Is that what you're trying to tell me? He looked at me and the tears just exploded out of his eyes and down his cheeks. You knew? You knew and you still hired me? Why? I said, well, I can't even imagine what it would be like to have been a police officer once and end up at the point. Did those people know your background? I can't imagine what it would be like to face my wife and children knowing that I just lost my membership in the church that I had served a two-year mission for. I can't imagine what it would be like to try and provide for a family of four children and a wife and nobody wanted to touch you. But more than that, what I saw sitting across from me was a man who was truly sorry for what he had done. Not that he got caught, was remorseful and was looking for another opportunity to prove himself. This big guy grabbed me and he hugged me so tight, I thought he was gonna squeeze all the life out of me and he just he put his hand on my shoulder and sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. But you know, when he retired after 30, 30 years, he was in charge of millions of dollars of my inventory, and I never worried about a dime of it. So you cannot, must not, ever judge someone at the finish line. 
because this guy was coming in dead last. We need to judge him from where they started from. Uh, how much time do you have? I'm sorry, how much? 40 minutes, 15 minutes. I'm sorry? 15, 20 minutes. 15, 20 minutes. You know, I, I, he told me, he said, tell your story. I'll tell about you. Okay, I, but I don't feel comfortable doing that because, like I said, so many people helped me along the way. But when things look the darkest, never give up. I, I've got to tell you, our patents ran out after 20 years. We created an entire new category for ladders. It never existed. By the way, this is one of our huge ladders we call a uh, skyscraper. John drug it out. He said, let me show you something we've had for 18 years. But we created a, a category for ladders that's never existed before. And I had to go out and educate America on a ladder that at that time was $200, $250, when you could buy a ladder for $9.95 to $29.95 at Sears. So it, it was looking pretty grim, but as we worked day in and day out, long hours doing uh, three, 400 trade shows a year, we finally got where we were starting to get recognized and then our patents ran out. And there are so many twinners out there that jumped on the market that we were sitting around one day and one of my board of directors made the comment, he says, you know how you started with nothing and you may just end up with nothing. And something clicked inside of me. If you tell me it's impossible, folks, I am on point. I'm on Zoom. I'm ready to go. And so we were kicking ideas around the table, and somebody said, well, I don't know how we ever reached any, anybody short of an infomercial. And they all laughed and went on with their idea. And they whoa, stop right there. Infomercial? They said, well, we don't want to do an infomercial. I'm going to ask for lipstick and stuff like that. And I said, wait a minute. We do well at a trade show because we get a chance to show our product. And an infomercial is nothing more than a much grander scale of, an in, of, a, of a trade show. So we did a trade, uh, an infomercial, and folks, I took the, every last penny I had to do this. And we were doing about $12, $14 million in volume, maybe a little bit more at that time. But I was hoping what it would do would make people aware of our product. I couldn't believe what happened. We went from 12 to 14 million a year to $2 million a day. It went nuts. People were calling up and ordering ladders like crazy. I went on QVC. The ladder company that had gone on before me, uh, a month before, had sold 18, 1,700 and some odd ladders in 24 hours. I sold 25,000 ladders plus in 24 hours. It just went crazy. And we had to start hiring people. But you know what was good about it was we had so many good, wonderful people that we could split them up and make them team leaders and hire green people in. And it made things happen in a big way. So I, I'm going to ask Brad to give me a little bit of a help here. Um, I really want to know what's going on inside your mind. I really want to know what kind of problems that you foresee in the future that you think are going to, are going to come your way. Let me tell you a problem that I have. I was born with partial, almost no hearing. I have no hearing in this ear, and I have 27% in this ear. I do wear a hearing aid because it picks it up in Bluetooth to what I hear over here to the other side. Now, there's an advantage to that. My wife told me, she said, I think one of the reasons you're successful is because you couldn't hear. I said, no, that can't be true. She said, no, 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 people you know, are telling you no, and you don't hear them, so you keep pushing for the deal. <laughs> and and I, 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 you know, I always had my feelings for her. I said, come on, that can't be true. She said, hey, it worked with me. So <laughs> she, I, I kept telling you no, and you kept asking for a date. So here we are. So if you, if you have a question that you, you think maybe I could entertain properly, would you please, I'm going to have him translate English to English for me because I can't hear that well. By the way, I didn't see your no drinking sign. I got to get something from my throat here. I've got a question, Hal. Let's start us off. Yo. How, when you uh, did the infomercial and your production went uh, like it did overnight, mm -hmm. how did you manage that? I mean, that's, that's some pretty major volume to have to ramp up to for most companies. How were you able to delivering all those orders that all of started flooding in. And that's a, and that's a really good question. Uh, you know, let me just tell you, people say, okay, we'll start a second shift or a third shift, we'll get 100% more, 200% with three shifts. You won't do that. 
I can promise you that if you get 60% increase by adding a second shift, you have done wonderful. Why? First of all, you have to take your good people and split them up to make them key factors of your new people. So now you have a learning curve of all these new people, and you have lost the, the uh, productivity that you had on your main group, plus your scrap starts to go out of sight, and the mistakes that people are making. And so what we did is we decided to have teams. And the teams, believe it or not, saved us. And let me, let me explain what we did. We'd take this really good guy over here, a gal, and we'd say, okay, you're the team leader of this, these seven other people. And you are all going to be paid on your individual efforts. In other words, you get a base salary, but on what you do over and above what was expected of you, we then will pay you a share of the profitability, profit sharing. You know, I never have had to go and say to someone, you're not doing your job, because the other seven are telling them before I can get there. They, wait a minute, John, you're affecting my income, so let's get it going. And then we made that, we made that um, bonus, there are two caveats. One, uh, scrap couldn't go up, and two, quality couldn't go down. Now, in the beginning, We'd only been doing it for about three weeks, and I could see some quality things that I didn't like. And I came in one night at 1 o'clock in the morning, I guess one morning at 1 o'clock in the morning, and I talked to a gentleman, my first name's Hector. I said, Hector, how many ladders have you done since you came on shift, your crew? 900. I said, let's unbox a couple of them and look at them. Now, they were good in the respect they were safe and they were functional, they did what they, but they didn't look like a Halloween product and they have my name on it when they go out. So I said, time out. Call your crew together. We called everybody together, and I said, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want you not to think I don't appreciate your efforts because you're building good ladders, but you're not building the type that Wing is known for. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to unpack every one of those ladders, almost a 1,000 of them, and we're going to take the band saws, and we're going to cut them up and put them in the scrap bill. I haven't had a bad letter since. Uh, that, that sent a pretty good message to them. Do you have any other questions? Does anybody have a question in their mind at all? Do you know what people care about? They care about what's in it for them. I don't care how good your product is, how good your sales presentation is. The one question that's in the back of everybody's mind, what is in it for me? And I love objections. Wow, I love objections. I've had salespeople that somebody will say, it's too expensive, or it's too, it's too heavy, or whatever. And they stop selling right then and there. Now, I've got to just use a, forgive me if you're not LDS, but I've got to use a church type of incident to explain to you. My wife and I served, as you said, some, Germ some German-speaking missions. And we left a gentleman that was really investigating the church, really wanted to join the church. We got two new missionaries that came behind us because we'd gone home. And the very first meeting they had with him, he looked at him and said, how old are you? And the kid said, I'm 19. Oh, where are you from? Boise, Idaho. And where are you from? Oh, I'm from Ogden, Utah. And how old are you? Oh, I'm 19 also. Uh-huh. What can you young men tell me about life? You ever had a child? No. Have you finished your education? No. Ever run a business? No. Ever scaled Mount Everest? I mean, he just really got down and dirty about that. No, no, no. So, so what can you two young men tell me about life? Let me just tell you, everybody loves to be told they're right, especially in Germany. <laughs> they folded their tent and left. What they should have done was said, Sir, you are absolutely 100% correct. We do not know one thing about life as you described it. Nothing. But there is something we know. And we know it with all our heart. And you can get it to know it too. We know that the true and everlasting gospel as was presented to the earth at the time of Adam and again at the time when Christ walked the dusty streets of the Holy Land has been restored upon the earth again. And this book here, sir, is a record of a people on the American continent. And we know that it's true. And you can get to know that too. Would you take this book and read it and pray about it? Now, if you're not LDS, forgive me for that example.
But that was exactly what they should have done. When somebody gives me the exam, an, 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 uh, <laughs> objection, I know that if I answer that objection correctly, that might be the only thing standing between me and making a sale. The only thing. So every time they give me an objection, I'm thrilled to death. Please tell me what you don't like. That's too expensive. OK, you'll pay that much for a good law more. And use it four months of the year and think nothing. After 10 years, they're throwing away and spending twice that much to get another one. But this ladder, you'll put up uh, Christmas lights, storm windows, put up the screens, take down the storm windows. You'll paint the house. You'll replace the bulbs. You'll be working around the house with this for the rest of your life, and your kids will be fighting over it. Where's your price objection? It depends. It depends on how you package it. Let me just, uh, I don't know how many of you are married or, or serious with a, with a girl or a, a boy, but if I look into my wife's face and say, sweetheart, when I gaze upon your face, time stands still. Ladies, am I going to win some points? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win some points, right? How about if I package it this way? Honey, you have a face that would stop a clock. <laughs> I'm sleeping on the couch, right? OK. So it depends on how you package it. And it's, the, all of life is this way. Be honest. Be absolutely brutally honest, but package it correctly. Yes, sir. Why, why didn't I give up? Yeah, what did you learn how to do that? Okay, okay. I admire the, the greatest generation that ever lived. These, these men that were left on those sandy, bloody beaches of, of Normandy. How I, I play taps at their funerals right, in, the, in the valley. I, I'm the bugler. And I feel like I'm standing on hallowed ground. And they were brave. But let me ask you a question. Where did they have to go? They were disgorged out on these sandy beaches. And that landing craft didn't say, OK, we'll wait here and see how you guys do, and we'll take you back to the ship if things don't work out. No, they went back for another crew. And what's happening? They're in the crossfire of the enemy, and they're getting bombed and shot to pieces, and the water's turning red with blood. What were their choices? Retreat and drown? Stay there and get killed? or take the beach. That's the situation I was in. I had one little girl passed away. So we had seven children, my wife and me. I'd never learned a trade. I hadn't finished college. I knew how to farm. And I had no property. What kept me going? The love of my family. I, I could never, ever stand having one of my children look at me and say, sweetheart, I mean, daddy, I'm hungry. And I'm hungry. And I couldn't feed them. But the other thing is, is I hate failure. I don't think you're ever a loser until you quit. I don't think you're a loser until you quit. If you quit, any, anybody can quit. Anybody can quit. Not everybody can dig that deep down and keep going where they need to keep going. And that was the thing that just kept me going. Um, I, I remember leaving the house one day, and my wife said, what time are you going to be home today? And I said, sweetheart, if I don't sell three ladders today, we're broke. It was that close. Three ladders. I came home that night and sold five ladders. And if anybody's ever seen my ladder used, you need all of your digits and arms and feet to make it work. I sold one to one arm guy. And uh, I mean, we got down on the ground and wrestled with that thing to show him how he could use that. But, <laughs> but we made it work. Okay? And he's happy and I'm happy. So uh, yeah, it just, and you have to get creative, really creative. Let me give you one quick example, and I'm going to wind this up. I'm working in the produce section. At the time I'm going to school, I'm working in the produce section. I'm loading hogs at the Lower Salt Lake Stockyard. And if you've ever loaded and unloaded hogs, never done that before, it's a treat. That'll push you, keep you going. But I hear this guy, the produce manager, saying, man, I wish I could find a really good used pickup. So I'm on my way home. And I drove by, and I just happened to see this sign that said, for sale on a, on a pickup, Dodge. I went back around, and I asked the guy, I said, can I take that for a drive? He said, sure. 
So I drove back over to the store, and I said to the manager, take this truck for a drive, see what you think of it. He came back and said, man, I love this truck. I said, great. He said, how much is it? It was $4,000. I said, it's 4500 <laughs> He said, okay. He wrote me out a check for 4500 I went to the Bonneville Bank and cashed it and went back and gave the guy 4000 He was happy. The other guy was happy, and I was really happy. <laughs> so, you know, and, and, and nobody, nobody did anything dishonest because it, it was worth what he paid for. He wouldn't have paid it. Uh, if you have any other questions, one thing I wanted to, want, want to leave for you. We're getting pretty close. Okay. Listen, I, um, one of these days, if you have time, I'm going to give this to Brad. When, this was uh, three decades ago. I wrote down some things that I thought would make, it would take to make us a, a business successful. And believe it or not, all 20 of these we have lived and died by for 38 years. All 20 of these. So if you'd like a copy of that, um, Brad would, 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 would get it for you, I'm sure. I was laying awake one night, worrying. And by the way, I only slept three and a half to five hours a night. I, I'm, I'm a freak of nature in more ways than one, but um, what do I have to offer anybody? What does Halloween have to offer anybody? And this is what I came up with. And please, I'm not a poet. This is the best I can do. I love uh, President Holland's father's talks because he just tears his chest open and lets you see inside his heart. And what you see is pure love. And he's one of my all-time favorite speakers. And this guy didn't fall far from the tree. But... This is something that I came up with. I walked the path alone, it seemed, not another soul in sight. I longed to share my fortune great, to make another's burden light. And there he was, just around the bend, sitting with his hand held out. I wondered why he labored not. He appeared so young and stout. And then I thought, it mattered not. I have so much to share. I reached into my pocket deep to show how much I cared. My offering he gladly took, and his pockets he did fill. But as I wandered down the path, I sensed him wanting still. I returned again to this beggar man and looked at him once more. It was trust, true, I had given up my wealth, but alas, he still was poor. It was not riches that he lacked, but a feeling of self-worth, something he could only earn if he gained if he knew his way on earth. I wondered aloud, what can I do to help this man distraught? As I searched my soul and pondered deep, to my mind came this fresh thought. That which I give and he earns not makes self-esteem sink low. He, myself, and all God's children need fields their seeds to sow. I called to him, come follow me. I have something for you to see. It may be strange and new to you, it's called opportunity. He did not move and looked confused, and a frown, frown formed on his brow. Had he never dared to try before? Did he have the courage now? Again, I bade him, come follow me. There's something you can do, for every man was, was born to win. This rule applies to you. With cautious steps, he moved ahead and sighed, I hope I can. Maybe someday, somehow, I can change this beggar into a man. The way was hard and the hill was steep. His brow was covered with sweat. His body ached and longed for rest, and sometimes he paused and wept. But deep inside he came to know and at least to finally see the only gift that would not degrade was opportunity. He labored on and learned to trade and earned his daily bread, and eat at each day's end where he once felt shame grew pride and joy instead. I too felt joy and a sense of pride for the efforts he had shown, not for any labor I'd put forth, for the seeds by him were sown. But I now had found the answer sought when someone is found in need to shower him with gifts and wealth. It's not the clock to beat. The way to truly help one grow and taste of victory, give him something he can use. Give him opportunity. I challenge you, go out into the world and give people an opportunity. And every time you help them get what they want, you'll get what you want automatically. It comes, follows like the, the night follows the day. Thank you for your time. Thank you.
for four minutes. Well, I think you can see why I love and admire this man so much. Uh, what, uh, what a life he's led, what an example he provides for all of you. Uh, Mr. Wing, on behalf of Utah Valley University and the Woodbury School of Business, the Reed and Christine Halliday Lecture Series, we present this gift. And thank you again for a wonderful and inspiring set of remarks. Your friendship and the friendship of this school means more to me than anything else. You know, I am so proud. You walk into this campus and you can feel, you can feel.